Hello, everyone. Welcome to the J3U podcast. I am your host, John Jewett. With me is co-host Luke Miller. And today we have a special guest, IFBB Pro, Corey Hagman. How are you doing, Corey? I'm good. I'm good. How are you guys? Excellent. Yeah, really good. <laughs> did I say your last name right? You did. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Got it. First it wasn't track. a hard one. I just I could maybe mispronounce that one, but I, I was thinking the same thing. Just wasn't saying it. <laughs> well, yeah, no. Um, wanted to have you on because we want to really investigate down into the challenges of bikini because there are some unique things about bikini that can make it, it, it hard, very hard on its own. As I know, it's perceived as having kind of this lower entry point from a muscle mass standpoint but there's a lot of other areas that make it very difficult and you know luke and i were both saying like your logs and how you're executing executing your prep and you're also self-coaching and at a pro level and that's a rarity (laughs) you usually don't see that happening um so we wanted to to dive into that and i know you're fairly a new pro um so (laughs) before we start if you could tell everyone just kind of a little bit about yourself, where, when you got into bikini and what led to your, your pro card and what, what have you done pro wise so far? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you guys so much for having me on. I mean, like this podcast, I've learned a lot of information from both of you and I really, I mean, I feel like at this point, like the success I had this past year, it was largely attributed to the information you guys put out. And I mean, that's why I want to share it with other people because at the end of the day, like there's so much information out there, but finding really good quality information, I mean, is, is difficult, especially specific to bikini. But um, yeah, I first got into competing in 2015 and it was right around the time I had come across Lane Norton. And I mean, we're dating back like, you know, almost 10 years ago where he's, you know, talking about flexible dieting and encouraging uh, female athletes, female competitors to really put an emphasis on their training and, you know, not be afraid or not be guided to train, you know, kind of how the magazines tell you to train as a a young athlete. And um, I had been tracking macros already. I I got into tracking and tracking calories um, when I was like 15. And I mean, granted, that's a a whole different discussion, but I mean, I had the experience doing it for some time before I even stepped on stage. I had an interest to step on stage for a while. And, you know, I kind of just decided my junior year in college um, there, I don't really have a reason why I wouldn't. And, you know, there's no, there's no better time to try. Like I'm in college, life is only going to get harder. I'm only going to have more demands in um, you know, even from a career standpoint. And I mean, this is a really good time for me to just dip my toes into competing. So um, I coached myself back then I was 19. And I mean, I did a lot wrong. um, But I mean, it was a really good challenge. And I mean, my whole goal at the time was say it was um, for myself, hey, I want to see this prep to the end. I want to you know, show up as conditioned as I can get myself with the knowledge I have. Um, and I want to do it in a way that, you know, does represent, um, you know, the bikini division well, but I want to utilize flexible dieting um, and not, not like the way we see a lot of it is on social media, not like the, if it fits your macros, which I, there's a time and place for it. But at this time I was really like, I just, I want to show other people, Hey, this like five, food meal plan that everyone's following like you can do that and that's fine if it works for your personality if you enjoy that that's okay but like there is there is more to be learned as an athlete going about it you know a little differently a little more independently um so I I did four shows back back then when I was in college and I, I took some time off because honestly um I never really nailed my conditioning I'd far, far from it. But I mean, um, I got back into competing in 2020 and really my, my focus was just, Hey, I want to show up. I want to be competitive. Um, so I did a couple shows in 2020 and then 2021 last year, I picked a national show and I was like, okay, like I was really close to turning pro in 2020. I was third. I was like one point away. And my in my class. So what show was I, that at in, in 2020? Uh, in nationals. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. So in November, I got got third, and I mean, it was the best I ever looked. But I mean, if we were to look at pictures, like I was still, I mean, like honestly, I was still like fifteen percent body fat. Like I was still on that higher end of bikini as it is now, and um, I mean, the look itself was just very different um, than what I brought in twenty twenty. So um, yeah, I did did another, I did Junior USA's, that was my first show last year. And I mean, I brought the most conditioned package I've ever brought and I won the overall and that's where I turned pro. Woo, overall. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned like missing the mark a few times, like what do you find is like your biggest challenges in those preps that you did versus the one that you turned pro in? Um. I would say the biggest issue was not knowing it's, I mean, it was two pronged. So like not knowing what stage lane looked like for me and also not being able to take myself there when I was self-coached. And then even, even in 2020, the shows I did, I had one of my best friends, I had him coaching me and he's someone I, I still, I, he's still one of my closest friends. Um, he's an amazing coach, but I mean, when you have a coach who you also have a relationship with, it becomes tricky because they, in at times, I mean, they don't want to push you to that, that conditioning because they, they know it's hard. They know you're suffering. And, um, you know, my, the Andrew Walker, that that's his name. He, um, it's an amazing coach, amazing friend, but he, you know, that was something we recap for like, okay, I didn't take you there and we didn't really know how lean you needed to get. Um, so it was just, I would say like a lack of experience. Whereas, um, I worked with Shane Hughley last year for entire season. And I mean, his forte, his expertise is getting girls conditioned. And that was why I picked him, you know, even Andrew, he's like, he's a great choice for what you're missing at this point in your career. And I mean, I'm confident he can get you there. He can get you that conditioning that you need. Back for self-coaching, like that's, I mean, you, cause you did quite a few shows for a few years coaching yourself and that's a, that's a pretty big task to take on. And, and usually I feel like nowadays, a lot of people will go to a coach right away. Did, were you, what were you studying in school or what, where were you really putting your education focus to feel like, ah, I can do this on my own? I, uh, stubborn? <laughs> I, I was very stubborn. I, I told the story a few times. I was failing my business math and I was writing out programming. I mean, what I thought was programming and I'm just like going through, I'm like, Oh, if I design this split and like, that's, that, that was my interest at the time. I mean, I was, I was really into Lane and Lauren Conlon and I still, still adore both of them and um, respect them a lot, but I was following people in the industry who were really really touching on, I don't want to say taboo topics, but at the time, I mean, 2014, 2015, there was one way to do it in bikini. And I mean, I mean, in other divisions too, but like, I mean, that was still, it was a new division and it was something that I, I just kind of, I really admired that um, independence and like, you know, both their ability to, uh, to lay out information for athletes, you know, to encourage them. Hey, like, you can educate yourself and yeah, like you don't, you can go to school for this, but if you're not going to school for it, which I wasn't, I was going to school for business. Um, I actually went to Texas A&M and uh, I really just admired their push to get bikini athletes. I, I don't want to say more educated. They just, they wanted people to be educated so that when they hired coaches, they had more of a leg to stand on, you know, when they were told just these blanket statements that I mean at this point we know are not true that was such a transition period I think for coaching with though like certain people coming out with how coaching the process should really be and at the time you just had a few people that were coaching uh, the gurus per se and you would get a lot of just here's your plan you do it and you don't question it and you don't have any resource to kind of like fact checked not not in a not in a sense to to like question your your coach but just to learn more on your own so you can better execute their plan uh so that was kind of like a really uh, some years around there because i was following i read all the lanes uh, stuff he was putting out on bodybuilding.com all his prep 
peak week stuff. And um, it, it was, it was a, it was a great period um, for us, yeah. like the, us nerds that were like breaking, breaking into it. So, um, so then, then, you know, fast forwarding back, you know, you started working with Shane and obviously you, you did exceptionally at, at junior USA's term pro went on to a, a, your pro show from there. what do you feel was the, the big transition, like, and even from with coaching with Andrew that, that you really figured out with Shane to make that difference and bring you in? I think the biggest difference that I, I experienced as an athlete was my, my goal working with Shane, like, I mean, you know, I collected, did some reflection, you know, after the 2020 season. And, you know, I said, I really don't want to work with a new coach. I don't want to, um, I don't want them to be afraid to diet me. And this was something I communicated with Shane on our first, you know, our consult, our initial phone call is that it's not the suffering I struggle with. It's, I, I want, I don't want you to be afraid to push me. And, um, I don't want to give you a reason to feel like you need to pull back or feel as if I can't, I can't hack it because, um, you know, there's a degree of acceptance within, you know, even bikini that like you are going to suffer and to get to those low body fats, you know, that suffering, it's going to be relative to you. It's going to feel differently, you know, dependent on how many times you've been that lean. Um, or if you, if you never, you know, gone there, if you haven't gone there, which I hadn't, I had no idea what I was getting into. It was just a matter of, okay, I'm, I'm coming to you. I, I have, I started working with him early January. You know, we had the show picked out. It was the first national show and, you know, we have like four and a half months. So, I mean, I think that math is right. Um, we, we got, we got plenty of time. Um, even though I was already coming off like a seven month season, I held my condition. I mean, I held pretty good conditioning for by all definitions, um, between those seasons. And I, you know, explained, Hey, I, it's not a matter of like, am I invested into getting where I need to be? I just, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know that. I don't know what that conditioning will look like. And at this point I, I do. And I, I know that, you know, even like going into this season, when you're, when you're at that point where you still have three or four weeks left of dieting, I mean, I was walking around and I'm I, every time I caught my reflection, either in the gym in the morning, I, I looked, I looked shredded. And even then that was still three, four, five more weeks of getting my lower body conditioned. So, I mean, I think, um, to answer your question more concisely, um, I think what I learned with him and like that, you know, that the main takeaway during that season was like, it really does come down to your ability to stay in that deficit and whatever deficit that is, that's appropriate for you. And can you sit there, even if certain body parts already look stage ready, can you, can you be there knowing that like, Hey, your, your fattest body part, that is, that's what we're waiting on. Like, that's the, yeah. that's the hold up, you know? Yeah. I think you, you make a really good point that I think's missed a lot in like wellness and bikini is like, using that what I call a rate limiter body part as like the standard at which you hold the prep, like not just looking in the mirror three, four weeks out and seeing like your shoulders are really lean, stride it out. And you have those like separations through all your delts and your back looks really lean. It's like, what's actually getting judged on stage here and what is your rate limiter body part? And that's kind of like the standard at which you have to hold yourself. Um, and I see a lot of coaches not doing that. And I think a lot of coaches don't do that because they feel like bikini is this little special class that shouldn't be treated the same as like some of the other classes. When we obviously there's class specific considerations, but we still have to get that rate limiter body part to the standard at which the class is holding it at. And do you feel like some people miss that because they feel like bikini is a separate thing in its own entity relative to the rest of uh, competing, or do you think like, what would be the unique bikini challenges for, for that class? I, I think you said it perfectly. I, I think that there's still a belief that was held in 2012, 2013, where bikini is bikini. And I mean, you'll hear it from the judges themselves. We want a look that, you know, you just woke up and went out to the beach. You look like refreshed and you don't look like you're starved and like miserable and just a, a wreck 
yeah, I know that would be great if I could just wake up and be that lean. I can't. And none of the, none of the top athletes do, they work to get to that condition. And, you know, one of the, um, one of the things I, I wanted to mention was that like, John, you put my pictures when we, um, when we started working together for weight training, you put my pictures next to Janet, um, the former Miss Olympia for 2020 and her transformation. She's, um, she's been number two in the world for, I mean, prior to 2020, she was number two for like seven or eight years and her conditioning, even in 2019 was vastly different, like just night and day different. We're talking like, I mean, five, six pounds difference in like, just from a composition standpoint, um, specific, specifically her tie-ins, her, her glutes, that, um, that upper hamstring lower glute area she's carved out. And I mean, that's amazing to see. That's really impressive. But I mean, as an athlete who's been in the sport for a long time, I, have seen a huge change with like, I, I wasn't hitting the conditioning standards in 2015. And that was like, I was still not hitting the mark. Whereas now, I mean, the level of conditioning that the judges won't directly say they want to see, but they do want to see it's kind of the, the standard. I mean, they want to see your full tie-ins. They want to see that, that shape of your lower glutes. And you're not going to get that unless you have a lot of muscle of just an insane amount of glute development or unless you're that lean, which I mean, it also does pose a challenge in itself because of, you know, if your glutes are that lean, are your hamstrings going to be too lean? Is your stomach going to be too lean? Which I mean, ironically, I mean, this is great feedback, but that was my feedback at my pro debut is your stomach is grainy and that's not what we want. That's too freaky, which I mean, I, I'm fortunate that I don't carry a lot of body fat there regardless, but to get my tie-ins to look the way top athletes have their, have their conditioning, have their physique, that takes getting my stomach there. And I think one of the things that I learned last year and that I, you know, I've been able to realize in the, in my off season is to get that look that those, those Olympians have, it does take getting as conditioned to, as, as I was, but you have to get that conditioning in order to spill in order to soften it up. You can't soften up body fat. Body fat's going to just look soft period on stage. So, um, yeah, that, I, I would say that's probably one of the biggest challenges that I, I see currently with today's division. Yeah. I, and cause like, I know when we were looking at your picks, Corey too, it's like, yeah, at that point, it's like, well, to get your glutes in more, it's get, it's get leaner. If, and that's that case. And then your upper body would be way too hard. Um, or it's, you know, build your glutes so big that you don't have to get quite as lean or, you know, to where they're not, you don't get that critique that your upper body is hard. Uh, but I think that's a great point. And I, I've even done that with Renee. Hey, let's diet a little past where you need to be. And then when we can always feed you a lot and get you really full and you'll, you'll soften up a little bit. Um, but you'll have that pop and not overly too hard, but you're right. Like if you're not conditioned to begin with, like, Ugh, it's kind of you're kind of in a tough spot so right. um coming out of these shows because like what you just laid out this was a long season for you uh, yes I, I mean it kind of strung it all together right from 2020 to 2021 like it was like two months maybe right and i think i, I don't think i touched on this but i after i turned pro i did my pro debut three weeks later and then yeah. I had a five week gap in between my next two shows. And, um, you know, what, what we discussed, you know, when I came to you, it was, hey, I have an injury that I do kind of need to rehab. I mean, I can't really do much about it other than take time off, but I also am coming off like a really long season and I've had this conditioning pretty much for eight weeks at this point. So I'm, I'm in, a, in a, a low as far as like, you know, just health markers and like where my where my body's happy at because you because this was a like because for one you've never been this lean but then you're coming into a, a, a post-show period now truly a post-show period right without this date ahead of a competition mm -hmm. so what were the big challenges going into the post-show period and, and and what did you do about them <laughs> 
I think the biggest challenge was the, the mental side, you know, is going to be challenging, I think, regardless of how experienced you are. Um, you know, everything that I'm gathering is that even if, even athletes who've been in the sport for a long time, they still struggle with reestablishing normal, semi-normal eating habits. And, um, you know, that was something that uh, my, my boyfriend, Patrick, helped me a lot with. And a big part of that is because he's invested in my success in the division, in the sport. But, you know, he also, he knows he's, um, we're going through, we, we've been through J3U together. So, I mean, like, he's, mm -hmm. he's like in it, like, I mean, he's really invested. Um, seeing, seeing how long it took for me to get to a, a normal, um, a, a mental state with, with food. Um, I mean, I knew that it was going to take a long time. I knew it was going to, it wasn't going to happen overnight and it was going to be a daily challenge, you know, kind of every, every meal is like, Hey, remember, you're not supposed to be leaner. You're not supposed to have the mindset you've had for a long time. Now it's time to transition back into like what normal is for you. And that's far from what you were at, you know, so um, establishing normal eating habits, it's definitely a challenge, especially being that lean. Um, the other challenge I would say this off season was, was actually just managing, managing the fatigue because then um, I think it was, I think it was Eric Helms. Um, it was on one of his episodes where he talked about everything you do in prep, every like shortcut you take where you don't manage something, you know, variable, um, you have to pay it forward later. Like you do have to pay for it, whether it's during prep, whether it's in your off season, whether you keep putting it off and it's, you know, a year post show. And what, um, what I found is that I had been going so long without managing my fatigue and recovery that, you know, my body was like, now we're, we're done. Like, you know, I, um, I pulled my serratus, uh, about three weeks before my show, my last two shows. And it got to the point where like any expansion of my rib cage um, was like, it just really, really painful. I mean, like I, I didn't post about this a lot, um, but I was wearing like ice packs, like in my sports bra, like 24 seven, I was like waking up in the middle of the night to change ice packs because there was so much inflammation. There's pounds of fluid just, um, on, on my rib, on my torso, on that, on just one side. And, um, you know, when I got to that point physically where it's like, okay, like your body is saying like, no, like no more, like, you know, I wasn't able to train. I wasn't able to pose. I wasn't able to even just have like a, a semi vacuumed stomach because that, that muscle was just so agitated. Um, so I, I think, I mean, granted that was the most severe challenge, uh, physically, but there were, there were also, you know, there were a lot of things like I, my cardio was extensive. It was way too high. Um, you know, so bring my steps down. From how, how high was it? Um, my, at, at, at its peak, it was two and a half hours. Um, and I sustained that for seven weeks between my pro day, uh, between my pro debut and turning pro, we dropped it down to 90, which it sounds insane, but like that is a breath of fresh air compared to two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, I got all the time in the world now. Um, but I mean, it stayed at 90 for the next um, six weeks. And I mean, my steps at the time, I, I, I didn't start tracking my steps until um, till I turned pro. I actually, um, the podcast you were on, uh, the Real Bodybuilding Podcast, yeah. that came out the day before I competed and I was in like the hotel gym and I'm doing, I'm posing, I'm doing my check-ins and I hadn't, I didn't know who you were. So I'm hearing it and I'm like, whoa, like everything that this guy is talking about just comes down to like managing your cardio, managing your diet, managing your timeline and nothing that you said, like there was no bro science about any of it, which is such a rarity these days. So um, you know, one of the things that you touched on in that episode was the importance of managing your steps, managing your meat and hadn't been doing that up until that point. So when I started managing it, I was looking at my steps and like, 
I'm at 25,000 steps a day. Like this is, <laughs> this is like silly. <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, getting, getting all of those things down, like just getting me back to a point where I'm like, Hey, I'm only doing an hour of cardio that, that took a, that took a while. That was, it was probably the biggest challenge. I mean, I think transitioning out of, out of that prep period. It seems like with bikini, with, with like the lower entry for muscle mass, it, it's kind of like, why even have an off season? Like if you've developed that size and they, you see these bikini girls compete like all year long, like in all the shows and even wellness now too, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. And uh, the rationale of the off season, just if it's not for muscle, it's like, well, why really even do it? Um, and I, I feel like that is more common in that in in these divisions than like 100%. bodybuilding or some of the male classes because there you need it for building. But there's a whole other aspect to it as far as just being able to repeat that process again. Uh, do you find in bikini that that's the common theme of these girls just show after show after show and are they improving? Are they, are they not? <laughs> not naturally. I mean, uh, <laughs> the ones that are adding five, 10 pounds of muscle while being, you know, 12, 13%. And I mean, it's not, it's not a dig. It's just, um, no, I, no, think, it's... I think what I see is that there's, there's a lot of misinformation around what you need to do to improve. And, um, I think if you are lacking in muscle in any capacity, you, you got to take time off. Like, I mean, you have to take time away from, you know, from being on stage. And I mean, holding that conditioning, even um, let's say you do have the muscle that you need, there are still consequences, um, you know, whether, whether you pay for them now or later, I mean, they catch up to you. And I do think, um, you know, the, the episode with Victoria that you guys just had, I, I think that touched on some really, like, really important points uh, in regards to, like, the female sex hormones and, and um, how, sorry, the sex hormones related to females and how even though you might have a monthly bleed, like, it doesn't mean you're ovulating. It doesn't mean you are not um, expediting that process to perimenopause, uh, to a perimenopausal state. And, I mean, that was one of the things that I, I really, really put under the microscope uh, this off season for myself because I, I had my period the entire prep. I mean, outside of like one or two months, and that was the first two months of prep. Like when I was, I was what, like one forty. I wasn't like lean, and I got it back once I was my leanest, and I kept it. You know, but even though something like that would be indicative of, oh, this person's healthy. Like we're not doing anything wrong. This is optimal. It's not. And I mean, we don't have anyone in the space who's kind of highlighting the importance of, of monitoring those markers um, in season and, and off season. Hi, John here. Just want to take a moment of your time to tell you about J3 University, our six-month education site designed to take your coaching to a high level. Whether it's male or female, off-season and contest prep, I cover it all with a science-based approach, but also a lot of in-the-trench experience. With the education materials, you also get access to the forums. You can ask any questions on those education topics. We'll also have live streams going on where I'll cover a variety of topics as well. You also get access to my training logs, completely raw, completely transparent of my contest prep, my off season. So go over to j3university.com and enroll today. Yeah, and that was kind of like the question I wanted to pose here is like in this, in this thought process, because like hearing the timeline in which you went through, like the first thing that comes to my head is how long was the HPA suppressed, right? And like, how long were we seeing these negative adaptations? And it sounds like you're a rather resilient person as far as like being able to manage that. Cause I've worked with a couple of bikini athletes were just like a prep. They're coming to me from just a prep and they're experiencing a lot of these negative issues that we're having to fix within an off season. But having that as a consideration for off season, I think is one of the biggest things in that, drawing out what we should be tracking, where we're, whether we're having no menstrual cycle or anovulatory menstrual cycles, or what are we having? Where is this hormone profile going? 
Um, you, you didn't experience anything from like a skewing of lab work within that from HPA adaptation from such a long duration of prep across 20 and 21? My knowledge, no. Um, I, wor I worked with uh, John about two, week two, three weeks after I ended my season. And I mean, there were some adaptations that, you know, you would expect, but there was nothing that stood out like, hey, like we got to get this fixed like ASAP. And um, I mean, one thing that I'm continuing to work on that I, I, I would guess it was not an issue directly caused from contest prep, but just an issue just I'm predisposed to is uh, just low progesterone. And that is something my sister has experienced. I mean, she, um, she has PCOS and she's had to go through IVF uh -huh. multiple times um, in order to uh, conceive and then, you know, see a baby to full term. But that's something I'm, you know, kind of realizing, hey, at this point, it's probably a health issue that was um, exclusive. It wasn't caused necessarily by prep. It's probably just something I have as an issue yet. I just I maybe wasn't aware of, um, yeah. but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, just from a objective standpoint, there were no lab markers that were really like out of, out of range. Um, but I mean, physiologically, I mean, those, those adaptations, you know, from even a ghrelin standpoint, um, yeah. I mean, they're through the roof. And at this point, I kind of just, I kind of believed that that was my normal, that was my default. And uh, it really wasn't until November, uh, November, December, when I started just really bringing um, training volume down, cardio down, like, like way down that I was able to see, oh, this is what not being hungry constantly and not having like the appetite of a 200 pound guy feels like this is how every girl feels. This is wild. I mean, but I think if you just constantly run at like, oh no, this, this prep semi prep state is normal. Well, you're going to think that that's how you're supposed to feel. And then, you know, where do you go? Once you start dieting, you're just going to feel worse and worse, which I, I think I, I think I got to experience that this year. Yeah. It can easily become the norm of prep doing it for that long. And even post-show, you'll get to a point where you're like, I feel pretty good. Like I'm recovered. And then you like get a little bit more fat on you or train, like drop some fatigue off. You're like, oh, wow, no, now I really feel better. It's like, man, how much more do I have to go? So it's a, uh, it's, it's an enlightening experience because you forget, yeah, what actual good feels like. Um, I want to touch on training since you brought it up, but before I do, you have low progesterone. So are you doing anything about that now? Leading. Yes. Um, I am supplementing with uh, 100 milligrams of micronized progesterone a day. And I, had, I did this, I started this in, uh, in January and I felt good, but my labs came back still, still low. I mean, that 100, um, that took me from a 1.1 to like a 2.3, which, you know, we, you and I looked at and we're like, well, that's still pretty low for like when it's supposed to be its highest. And, um, you know, I've, I've tried playing with a slightly higher dose, but at the same time, I think it's something that like, I need lab work to, to really know, Hey, is this gonna, is this gonna move the needle and to what degree? Um, I, I do feel better though. I mean, like, I feel like there's a lowered state of like anxiety and like that stress, um, generally throughout the month yeah it's tough too with because a lot of the the progesterone delivery systems are fairly short-lived and so till time when you take your progesterone and when you pull your labs you might not quite pull it at that that exact peak of it um so it's one of the one of the challenges so even as looking at like practitioners that are prescribing a lot of them still are going off of subjective markers of how a patient feels um, and, and using that as a primary over just serum markers. Of course, we look at them, but uh, sometimes they're just, it, it's hard to be accurately telling with those. Um, but that's great that you're, you're feeling better now on it. Um, going back to the training piece, because now you are, 
you are very meticulous with your training and how you're programming it. Um, what is your, your general setup and, and how do you find that it differs from a lot of what you've seen uh, commonly done in, in bikini? So how I was training before was, I mean, we're, we're talking like 30 sets minimum a workout. And I mean, um, very high rep range, very low R RIR. Um, and I think, I think the reason I even got to that point where I felt like, Hey, this is, this is optimal training for me is largely due to the culture and the, I mean, the social culture around training in bikini. Um, as, as you, as you've said, like the barrier for entry from a muscle density standpoint is much different than other divisions. And there, I, I think it really is a scapegoat to, you know, for the coaches to continue to tell athletes like, oh, we want your glutes bigger, but we don't want your legs. So we're not going to do anything that causes any kind of stimulation to your quads and hamstrings. And there's this belief that, okay, well, you can, and you, you can train glutes four or five times a week. Um, and you can set up your split that way. But for athletes like myself, who do actually need more muscle mass and they need I don't want to say I need it in a short amount of time, but like they, they want to be able to compete again. They want to have developed enough muscle to, um, to make a progression. You're, you're not going to see that progress, um, training that way. And ultimately what I found is that training at that high of a volume, um, even if you're doing the right lifts, even if you are hip thrusting, um, using a glute drive, even if you're doing things that directly work the glutes, um, you're going to get into a position during prep where you have nowhere to go with your volume. And if you don't get injured, which is the you know, best case scenario, you're probably going to be in a position where your weight, the actual weight you're moving, your load is going to go down. So, you know, you're dieted down. Um, your training is now on the decline over many months. If your season's extended, you know, you're in a position where you can't do much, like you can't really pull back. And, um, this off season, I really wanted to restructure my training because I was told, I've been told countless times I've shown people my training and they've said, oh, you're doing everything perfect. There's nothing you can do that can be better. And, um, when I came to you with my training, um, I was, I got, I was blown away because I mean, you were in a very respectfully, you were like, Hey, I, I just don't think you're maximizing, um, your your efforts here. I mean, you're in the gym five, six days a week and you're spending two hours in the gym, but you're not, you're, you're not making the progress you should. You're not pushing the weights you should. You're not training the intensity at the intensity that's appropriate for your goals. So if that's something you want to do, there's going to be some restructuring. And what we're, what I'm doing now is I'm training four days a week. I have, you know, four training days. I have other days that are designated recovery days that are intended to let me recover from training at such a higher intensity now. And even though I, I've always been a fan of, you know, progressively overloading, and I, even though I've, I've attempted to do that for years, um, it's much different when you actually train at the intensity you're supposed to be at. And I mean, that is going to be relative to the individual and, you know, to their mechanical limitations, but there are a lot of movements that are completely safe, um, to go to that RIR, to, to go to an RIR of one, to hit failure. And if you're not doing it and there's not a reason you're not doing it, it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you still need to make um, those improvements for, for your next season. So my, um, my training, I mean, is structured in a way to support growing my glutes. So, I mean, I have a heavy, heavy emphasis on glute drive and on movements that are specific um, specifically glute biased. So I mean like dumbbell split squats, that was something I've been doing for years. I've never done them the way I'm doing them now. And I mean, your attention to detail and looking at the angle of my, my knee, my hips in, in relation to my upper body, everything has a purpose and has been ironed out to where I, I know, Hey, like this is more than enough volume to 
to get a lot out of this session. And if I'm, as long as I'm eating and I am recovering and I'm, I'm tracking, you know, how, how I feel, um, in the gym, you know, how hard I can push, I'm going to see those changes. And I mean, I think traditionally there's just this belief that in bikini, Hey, you get a pump, you get a glute pump, you get a shoulder pump and you're out, you're good. I mean, train for two and a half hours, pick 14 different exercises and do 25 reps because, you know, we're trying to tone the muscle. And I think that kind of misinformation. I hurt my soul. <laughs> I know. I was saying, I'm about to, I'm about to add something to this in a second. Sorry. Continue. Sorry. I know I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. Um, it, uh, I understand where it comes from because I, I myself fell into that trap. So, I mean, like I, for listeners, I don't want anyone to think this is like, it's very easy to get caught up in that and to be told like, Hey, this is how this pro is training, or this is how, you know, this, this girl, you know, who I see in person, who looks amazing is training. So I should do that. But I think it's important to remember, you know, the, the actual training principles and like, you know, what it takes like physiologically to build muscle and to not get lost into, well, my division is specific. And like, I need a special program that's completely different than every other athletes, you know? Um, yeah. 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 I think, I think you, that's, that's why it is important. I think for one to educate yourself. So you know why, how muscle is supposed to be built. And then it kind of gives you a reason of what you should be doing in the gym gym. Like we know, tension is this main mechanism of growth. It's not pump, right? If it was pump, yes, we would be chasing the pump, but that is such a, a subjective thing to understand. Like, Oh, I get a pump. I'm training that muscle. And, and, and yes. Um, but it's still not our main thing that's really causing it. So if you realize it's this tension stimulus and you need to increase this tension over time, I think that's where it kind of really separates of th this applies to all of us in every division not just to bikini or open bodybuilding or whatever it may be. Um, so I think it's, it's just a, a lack of, it is kind of a lack of education of what we should be doing and, and not, you know, it's, it's of, of, out of ignorance, just uh, unawareness, right? Not, not out of a neglect of, of knowing so, but um, even these top pros, if we watch it, how they train, a lot of times they've gone there because they're probably going to be there anyway. And we, we hate them for it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We don't hate them, but <laughs> you know, they're, they're not going to have to probably take it to the, the level that others might that and, and explore all the other options. Um, but like you said, I think in bikini, it, it's easily to drive up a lot of volume and not make the, those sets that you're doing of high quality. And then once you realize what a high quality set is, you're like, there's no way I can do 30 of these. Right. <laughs> Like the three minute rest breaks in between my top sets on hip thrust. I'm not like, I'm, I'm like, Shit, I wish I had another minute. Like my heart rate's still elevated. <laughs> and yeah. that, I'm learning, like I've been able to learn this last, um, this last off season. That's how I should feel. Like I should be in a position where I need those rest breaks. And if you don't need the rest breaks, maybe that's an indication that you could have put more weight or if, um, you know, recently I was talking to, talking to someone about this, like if you're able to do these like crazy, crazy back off sets at the end or your warm up sets or 20, 25 reps, like maybe that energy could be better utilized. And I think, um, I think there are a lot of bikini athletes that would utilize, like would, would appreciate that information if it was out there. And if it was like maybe laid out specific to them, um, but I think that kind of information, it's just, it's not, it's not even really targeted at bikini as a division as a whole, um, where I hopefully, hopefully like, I think the content that I've been putting out more recently, I mean, it, it encourages other girls to be like, Hey, this is more or less maybe how your training should be structured. This is how I'm structuring mine. And I'm seeing amazing results without having to be in the gym six days a week, without having to train glutes and all these weird ways that just don't really support muscle growth you know yeah i think a lot of times too just as like a caveat to kind of round that out is like uh overuse patterns in bikini i'll see a lot they're constantly um 
using a glute bridge as a staple pattern across multiple other sessions. So we see glute bridge as a main pattern three and four times a week. And I'm not one to throw a glute bridge out. I think it's a great pattern to use within the class, but that frequency of loading on a hip joint that's meant to take load um, in a vertical plane, not overly into a horizontal plane with like just how human structure is built leads to a lot of issues because one, we're loading the hip joint in like a, a horizontal plane that is not meant to be loaded in. Two, people don't really take a glute bridge from a setup perspective where we need, like the one that you tagged us in uh, a couple, I think it was last week, like executing it that way because bikini girls are often in this like posteriorly compressed position, anterior pelvic tilts very often. You'll start seeing a lot of issues with like rib cage management, QL issues, knee issues, even adductors sometimes. And a lot of it's driven just from frequency of loading throughout that horizontal plane through the hip joint. And like, because that they're not taking the mechanical tension program design as their priority, where if they were, there's no way in hell they'd be doing it three, four or five times a week. Right. Sure. And, it, and oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, even, even at that frequency, like working in an appropriate rep range, you know, working with the intention, yeah. hey, like I'm, I'm, I might be able to do more weight for my second session of, of glute drive, but I'm not doing those higher rep. I'm not working in a higher rep range. I'm working in, you know, that six to 10 rep range. So, I mean, it's having those kind of accommodations based on the movement itself and based on your ability to not just handle the load when you're working out, but also the recovery from that workout. Yeah. And even the, like you're saying, look, the, the overuse, just posing and you're like in a prep, it's where it gets really unsustainable because you have so much of, of that po uh, anterior tilt shifting to one side of your, you know, whatever hip you pose on and then that's get overused. Then you go into a bilateral pattern and then you're like, wow, why am I hurting my lower back? Um, and it just, just keeps going or, or a lot of like, you know, hip abduction, um, you know, in external rotation work and just overuse, um, piriformis, all, all those external rotators get worked. So, um, becomes problematic. So, um, now, but now Corey to wrap, they were going back into post-show. Now you're back like full circle to self-coaching again. Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, um, how did you come about to this aspect? And then I want to just get into how you laid out this prep, like what are you going to do different this time around? So the, the, the real push that made me feel confident in coaching myself this season, um, you know, was the conversation we had um, earlier in the year, you know, early January when I, you know, laid out, Hey, this is my, this is my plan. Um, I am no longer working with Shane and I can't really pinpoint another big bikini coach that I, I feel confident, like is, is going to give me the same degree of attention that I'm going to give myself. Um, and you know, at the time I, I, I really just started thinking about it. I'm like, well, I'm invested into this. I'm, I'm invested into getting the most out of my preps. And I, I think it is unreasonable to expect a coach who, you know, even at a coach who doesn't have, um, the same volume, even a coach who has 10 other clients, I mean, they still have 10 other or nine other clients. They still have nine other athletes that they are dedicated to, you know, doing well. And, um, whereas if I, if I coach myself, I mean, like I, I have one client that I, I get to have like daily conversations with, like I have one person I need to worry about all of these variables. And I think, you know, the more clients you have, the harder it becomes to standardize the amount of attention and the quality of coaching that you're able to give them, um, you know, whether you want to or not, I mean, the, the more clients, um, the, the differences in their needs, you know, from a person to person basis. Whereas I, I feel like the, the risk or really like the cons of, of self-coaching at, at this point, they, they don't outweigh the benefits. Um, I, originally had wanted to work with a coach because I wanted to take that stress off of my plate as far as like managing myself. And what I was able to realize is that, you know, that actually doesn't cause as much stress as maybe I 
believed at a certain point. Um, and it's actually much more stressful to feel, and I, I don't say this like necessarily just personally, I think globally, a lot of clients, I mean, when you, when you're, when your coach has many athletes, you do have those details that are missed check in, check in. And, you know, to some extent that's, to some extent it's acceptable um, and it's, you know, forgivable, but when you're an athlete who is invested into your prep, um, you can only forgive that so many times before it becomes, well, Hey, like I, I can't really like make progress and see my, see my full potential. If like, you know, my coach isn't concerned about these things that I, I a hundred percent, I know are important. And, um, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, after, after we talked earlier in the year that you're, you were the most successful self-coached IFPV pro. And I mean, like you're doing it for yourself. You're also, you're doing it in a way that does place such a heavy focus on the sustainability and the longevity in the sport. And, you know, I think it was, it was earlier in the year, um, Trevor Whitman, he posted one of your stage shots and like the caption was like, oh, John Jewett showed up in shape again, shocker. And it was, it was so comical because that is the reputation that you've developed even, especially with self-coaching that you're gonna show up in shape. I mean, that's, that is something, your conditioning is something that um, you're highly respected for. And I feel like that is, that, that is what I aspire to do. I aspire to be a pro that's known for their conditioning, that's known to consistently be able to peak themselves. And that's not, it's not done by accident. You know, that's, there's a lot of legwork that goes into that. And it's a lot of effort on, on the client's part and the coach's part. And I feel like at this point in my career, I, I can't expect a coach to do that for me the way I'm going to do it for me. So, um, that, that was probably the biggest, biggest factor in, you know, making that, that final decision. And, um, as far as like changes for this prep, I mean, the biggest change I'm making is having a set timeline and having weekly goals as far as like, this is the amount of fat I want to see. I, I want to lose the amount of body weight I want to lose. And, um, if that's not met, we're going to adjust and it's not going to be this ambiguous. Oh, well, we hope that you're losing fat, even though your scale weight is up, or even though like, we don't have any proof that you actually are losing fat. We just, we hope that in four weeks you'll look leaner. And I feel like that's an approach. A lot of people kind of, kind of take, you know, Hey, I've, I have no expectations as to what my weight's going to be at the end of the week. And I just hope this coach can like see those differences where I don't, I, I want, I want to rely on objective data. I want to rely on um, things that make that self-coaching process a lot easier. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, if you could go into more detail on it, Corey, cause I think it, I think it's interesting on how you set up the timeline because I, I kind of have, I do the, do the same. Um, cause you have previous data you've gone off of like kind of where you need to be stage right wise, wise roughly and where you're at now and how you set up your weeks. So I know you, you have this extensive Excel sheet. That's yeah. impressive. Any, <laughs> um, so like, yeah, what's the, what's the example of like just your general setup, maybe last past week or, or a couple of weeks, just to give people listening, like an idea how, how you mapped it out. Right. Right. I, I can do that. So, um, I'm, almost finished with my fifth week of contest prep. And I have had a goal, a target goal of 1% body weight loss per week. So, um, you know, my starting weight um, was 142. And this is all like formulated in, in a spreadsheet so that I can see, okay, well, based on the projection, based on like the plan, here's what I'm actually losing. And if it's more or if it's less, that, that, that weight, the following week is going to adjust, but, um, 1%, I think is a very acceptable, uh, rate of fat loss for the current, the, the body fat I started prep at and the body fat I need to get to. Um, and this is all with the idea that, Hey, like there is a certain point where I'm going to be lean enough where this rate of fat loss is going to decrease. So rather than continue to stay at this 1% for the entirety of prep, um, I'll 
be able to scale that back as I get leaner and as I'm able to see, okay, this is how much fat generally I, I've left to lose. And um, I mean, honestly, like people, I've, I've received this a lot. Like people have assumed other, other bikini competitors have assumed self-coaching is got to be really stressful. It's got to be so hard because you're in prep and your mind plays games on you. But I think when you can make that process, that like coaching process, very objective, and you can pull the emotions out of it, at least thus far, it's not been stressful at all. It's actually been very, just a very smooth system I have in place. And, um, you know, additionally, in, in, in addition to tracking weight, I'm also looking at my measurements and looking at calipers and I have data from when I ended my season. So I have, you know, a rough idea of how many inches I'm still off or, you know, the, the body fat in, in, um, you know, in my legs of generally what I ended at and where I'm at now. So I, I can kind of, kind of create a little picture of, okay, well, this is the weight I think I'm going to compete at roughly, but from a composition standpoint, this is, um, this is the fat, this is where it's currently at and you know, just consistently working towards like getting that number down and seeing how it trends, seeing, um, on a weekly basis, how many inches, you know, in my measurements, am I going down on, um, that, that has been really, really helpful, um, on a weekly basis. Yeah, no, I think it, it's nice to make that timeline. I think for someone like, well, Hey, I've never competed before. I don't have all this data to go with previously. It's like, well, you, you do, you kind of have to get there and have a, have someone give you an idea. But I would say if you're competing for the first time, like, get a coach, like yeah, you'll, you'll take it some pretty good steps forward just to, then you could collect the data along the way. And, and at some point, maybe you could help with coaching yourself if that's what you even want to do, but uh, to have, have been there, it kind of gives you a really good idea. I think, you know, if, if you talk to like, and this should go for bikini, but you know, for natural bodybuilding competing um, it, it's very much scale based because if the scale's not going down, they're generally not losing body fat. I mean, it's not like they're going to be building muscle on prep. That just doesn't happen. Um, and, and then you go into the IPB and in, in certain female divisions, not really bikini, lots of male divisions, like you have a perform, like physique enhancing drugs and it like murkies the water of, of rates of weight loss. Um, so people are just kind of look at pics and you're like, oh yeah, weight's not changing, but you're looking tighter. And so it's like, okay. Um, but I think that shoots a lot of people in the foot too. Um, and even in like classes like bikini where it's just like, oh yeah, no, you're good. Looking a little tighter. You'll probably drop next week. Like you said, right? Like we're, we'll, we'll hope it's going to happen. Um, yeah, then you get to the end, end of your, end of your prep and it's like, oh man, well, let's race it off. So it's the opposite, like get out the gate push some fat loss off quick and then slow it down at the end when you're already trying to really manage, manage fatigue a lot. Um, what, what are you doing this time around? Like what'd you pick up last year, like fatigue wise, cause you brought that up that you want to have in place this year. Um, anything done differently for cardio fatigue management? Um, I know I already talked about your training, but anything else that stands out to you? Right. Um, you know, I, I think, um, I think what I find is making the biggest, um, I think what's helping this prep, I mean, and helping it feel just a lot smoother and um, building some confidence in myself that I'm not gonna run into the same issue that I that I did before is um, I am tracking, you know, sleep. I am aware of these things and there are gonna be days, I mean, even when you're not in prep, there are gonna be days where you don't, sleep well and where your recovery is not on point, but what you don't measure, you can't manage. And I, I think that's something that's across all divisions is neglected is um, the athlete's ability to recover. And granted, some of that is going to be you know, subjective and it's going to be dependent on how the athlete perceives that fatigue. But I wish, and I, I hope that, you know, hope that I can help see this out that, you know, more athletes in my division, more, more women can start looking at these markers like your recovery. Um, and, and simply just say, Hey, from, from a coaching perspective, I want my athletes to care about these things as much as they do their dietary adherence. I want them to care about it as much as they do their training. 
it's great if you hit all your workouts and didn't have any like deviations or didn't have any areas that, you know, weren't executed. Um, but if your recovery is in the trash and you're consistently not including that in a check-in that that's an issue. And I feel like I, I feel like this season I am creating, I'm, I'm making that a priority. Um, not just from like a sleep standpoint, but also just, a um, even a cardio standpoint, you know, I'm not escalating my cardio the way it was last year. And I'm, I'm better for it. My body just doesn't, my body doesn't look tired. And even though I'm dropping body fat at a faster rate, I mean, this, this rate of fat loss feels incredibly fast compared to what I'm used to. But I also, I see the benefit in doing so now when I'm coherent, when I'm when I'm a little healthier, when I cognitively am a little sharper, because I, I think I said this on a, on a podcast I recorded last week. I think that a lot of people try to fit in, you know, their, their entirety of prep, their three, four months of prep. They try to fit in that amount of fat loss in the last six to eight weeks, because they realize I'm I'm not going to be ready. I'm not even anywhere close. And I, I was in that position. I was 137 trying to lose, you know, over 10 pounds, like, I mean, like 10, 15 pounds in six weeks. And regardless of maybe what should have been, you know, more appropriate call at the time, it is possible, but just because something's possible doesn't mean it's optimal. And I really feel like that needs to be planned in advance. You know, how are you going to go about creating your deficit and what is the level of discomfort you're willing to experience off the rip of prep, like when you, when you start, um, and what, what's acceptable because these like last six weeks of just like crashing into a show many, many times in which the athlete isn't even at the conditioning they, they want to be at, or they were aiming for it. It doesn't result in a good off season, which doesn't result in a good prep, you know, coming after that. So really from the, the get-go, I mean, things like my off days, I'm not trying to find ways to, you know, burn a little, burn more calories. I'm, I'm taking those designated off days as like this focus today, the intention is to recover so that you can lift tomorrow and you can lift at the intensity you should lift at. And I, I think when I started thinking about training that way and thinking about even fat loss that way is like, I, I feel like I was I just found the whole process to be easier. I can completely agree. Yeah. And, and, and relate in that so much. It's, it's be last like, John, how'd you get so lean? It's like, I managed fatigue and then I was able to take myself there. So if you learn to manage fatigue, that's when you're going to get the next level of stage lean and racing it at the end and carrying that much fatigue, you, you just won't get leaner. You'll deplete you'll get a small version of yourself. And you, like you said, Corey, like you just look tired. The physique looks tired. Um, and then it sets you up for a rough post show with all that fatigue. Food focus is crazy high and uh, hormonally you're in, in, in a disarray. So this should be an excellent prep for you. I'm excited to, to be able to follow it along too. Um, any, any uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up, but any takeaways that you just want to leave for the bikini division bikini listeners um that you i know you already gave some some good nuggets but anything else you wanted to say yes yeah i actually i have a good one um i for a long time i had this belief that i couldn't i just it, i physiologically couldn't get as conditioned as i needed to and i, I just believe i'm like i think i previous coaches or other athletes tell me, oh, your, your skin is just thick. Like, you know, your legs, that's just like, it's just not going to happen for you. Some girls are that way. And I hear this like belief, I hear it perpetuated amongst athletes. And I have heard it from top pros that, you know, they're also told these things that like, no, for your body, we've got to just, we've got to do this really rigid, just no fat, no carb diet. And you know, you're going to have to do these three hours of cardio because that's the only way you're going to lose that body fat. And I think for listeners, really what I, you know, if there's one thing I, I can say, like as a word of encouragement is like, 
it simply does come down to having enough runway to get that conditioned and to see out your diet. And yes, that, that might mean having to get more aggressive than another competitor. That might mean having to, you know, relatively work harder, but it is possible. It's not a limitation. And I think it's, um, Jim quick who said, who said this, um, if you fight hard enough for your limits, you get to keep them. And this was a big reason that I took that time off in between, you know, like my first four shows and, and these, these last two years of competing, it was because I just believed I, I didn't have it in me to attain that conditioning. And what I know now is that there is no secret. There's no, there's no dietary meal, like meal plan or protocol. That's like, just going to give you this advantage over all these other athletes. It's not that these top pros have a secret. It's that they're willing to suffer. They're willing to diet hard enough and uh, spend that time, you know, getting there. But it, you might look at yourself and you might see, okay, like from, I mean, from the waist up, like maybe you look stage ready for weeks, but to get that conditioning you need, you know, from top to bottom, it, it just might take longer. So like, you know, definitely don't, don't give up. Don't like lose faith and, and don't buy into this idea that like there's, your coach has got like the secret formula to get you there. It's diet and cardio. And if you're already low, if you're already low calorie, if you're already high cardio, it's very likely going to take more. And there is a threshold where that is too much and maybe you shouldn't go there. Maybe that means that you need some time off to set yourself up to get leaner next year, but it is possible. And I mean, this is coming from someone who like for years just didn't believe that it was. Yeah, I mean, you got, you got to nail the basics, right? And and, and that's basically what you said. It, and it's like, but people don't. It's like, we, we get focused on the nuance and you miss that you're not nailing the basics, right? Um, well, well, Corey, thank you so much for coming on. For people that want to follow along on your prep, um, where can they do that at? And if you are taking on clients or anything in that regard, please feel free to share it. Yeah, I um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you both. I am on Instagram at Corey underscore fit. And I am accepting clients, um, both for lifestyle and then for contest prep. So if that's something you're interested in, um, I got my email on Instagram. So shoot me an email and we'll set up a call. We'll talk. Cool. We'll put all that in the show notes as well for, for anyone listening. Um, thanks again for coming on J3 University and we will talk to you next time.